we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination, except we have been called by his name. The great big gold book called Evidence of Man's Verdict, I wrote that against Christianity and in the process became one of them. But uh, so I set out, traveled all over the world, gathering the evidence to write that book. And it was in a library in a small museum in London, England. It was a Friday night about 6.30. I leaned back in my chair, cut my hands behind my head, and right in front of everyone, which was probably three people, I said, it's true. It's true. It's true. I returned to the university, and I put it to the test. There were several things that intellectually persuaded me. One was the scriptures, the Bible. I concluded intellectually that it is true and I can trust it historically and theologically. And I've debated that over 250 times in universities around the world. Second, the person of Jesus Christ. I concluded he is the son of God. Oh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. But I concluded he was. Second, third, the resurrection. The resurrection. Oh, I thought, what a joke. Come on. People, when you're dead, you're dead. That was my worldview. I never met anyone who raised in the dead. I met some people who looked like they ought to be. But I had never met anyone who had physically been raised in the dead. I thought, you can't believe that. Well, I remember I was sitting in that dorm room on a Saturday night in the university. And I just finished all this research to refute it, which is in my book, Evidence. And I finally said, he is risen. He is risen. I've read all the great writers. I've read all the writers that think they're great. And I concluded not one of them, not one scholar, has ever given me an honest intellectual argument to refute the resurrection, at least to my, my level of understanding. And then the fourth area is what I want to address this morning. It has to do with Christmas. I thought Christmas, again, was a joke. It was just devised to be able to sell gifts and make money economically. But what captured my thinking intellectually in the process of these other areas was all the prophecies from the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Folks, you have to understand, I didn't want to believe. I was satisfied in my life. I had my whole life mapped out, and Jesus was not a part of it. In fact, I thought he would destroy it. He did. He gave me a better one. But in the scriptures, there's 333 prophecies in the Old Testament about who the coming Messiah will be. I actually say there's 70 major prophecies and 270 ramifications. In other words, there's 70 basic prophecies. And then God through the ages would add to them, add another detail, which was a prophecy in itself, but it would add it around the same initial prophecy. So there's 333 prophecies all fulfilled in one person. The Old Testament written over a period of about 1,000 years was completed over 500 years before Christ. <laughs> in university, I'd always wait for this because somebody would pop up the professor or something, say, wait a minute, Josh, I don't think that's true. I don't think these prophecies were written down till the time of Christ. And they were written down so they would coincide with his life so it looked like he was fulfilling them. That sounds pretty good, unless you want to think. And most people would rather die than think. You say, it's not a 500-year gap. Well, look, the Septuagint, don't let that big word throw you. The Septuagint is the name given to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. When they took the Old Testament, put it into Greek, they call it the Septuagint. You know when that was initiated? It has all the prophecies in it, everything, 250 years before Christ. Now, folks, if you've got a problem with 500 years, you've got a bigger problem with 250 years because, boy, it is documented historically. The Septuagint was started its translation 250 years before Christ is ever born. So history absolutely proves there's at least a 250-year gap from these prophecies being written down, their fulfillment in Christ. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, no matter what translation you have, 
it'll say something like this. Chapter 4, verse 4. But when the right time came, the exact, the wording in the Greek is when every exact detail had been fulfilled. Now you're with me. Think with me. When every exact detail had been fulfilled. In other words, when the right time came, which when every exact detail had been fulfilled, God sent his son the first Christmas. When every exact detail, which is prophecy from the Old Testament. In Luke 24, Jesus' disciples just didn't get it. I think they were from the Northeast. They just didn't get it. And it says, and he said to them, Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. When it was not, when it, when it, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then in Acts 3, God was fulfilling what all the prophets had declared about the Messiah beforehand. And then in chapter 17, as, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service. And for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the pro prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. I want to look at those prophecies. Because it's an area that I really struggle with. It's probably one of the two biggest areas that took me over the edge in the university to place my trust in Christ as Savior and Lord against my total desire in my life and my will. And I had to really be convinced of it to go against all of that. I look at it as an address. God writing an address to identify his son from everyone who has ever lived. I believe... Now, I'm not dogmatic on this because I haven't done enough research on it, but I think there are 40 major people who claim to be the Messiah historically. And as far as I know, not one of them ever appealed to prophecy to substantiate their claims. They couldn't. They couldn't appeal to the detail, and you'll see why in a little bit. Your address, now think of it. Your own personal address, even if it's a P.O. box or general delivery, separates you from 6.8 billion people on the face of the earth? Now think of that. Your address. No matter where in the world they send you a letter, it'll get to you, usually. It'll get to you instead of somebody else of the 6.7 billion people. Do you ever think how unique your address is? Well, God wrote an address that would identify his son from everyone who ever lived. Now keep in your mind, in the fullness of time, when every exact detail had been fulfilled, God sent forth his son. Let's look at that address. Now I can't do this the normal way I do because the way the PowerPoint is set up uh, with the mechanism here, they can't do it progressively. And so you're going to lose some of the impact because we can't do the progressiveness as I speak, where normally you see it on the screen, boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to speak faster than most people you've ever heard speak in some of this. I'll, I'll match many auctioneers. Because I don't want you to get so much the content, I want you to get the impact of the content. You can go to josh.org forward slash resource and download all the content, all the documentation, everything. Now, let's see God writing this address. It all starts out before recorded time, and it says... In Genesis 3.15, he'd be born of the seed of the woman. You say, well, Josh, that's nice. Well, look, every single person in the scripture, other people, was always the seed of the man. The only one in scripture to be born of the seed of the woman was the Messiah. Why? The virgin birth. The only one. So first, seed of the woman. Then we go down to recorded time. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Do you realize 
that all nations of the world can be traced back to one of these three individuals? A lot of people don't realize that. Now God eliminates two-thirds of the nations of the world when he says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem. And then the lineage of Shem, there were many lines of descendants. And now God uh, n- n- eliminates all of them but one. When he says that my son will not only be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, but the descendants of Abraham, who we called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Now Abraham had eight children, two by Sarah. Now God eliminates seven eights of the sons of Abraham. Now think of this. T- 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 I brushed my teeth this morning. I've been having trouble with them ever since. Uh, <laughs> I have a stutter. It only comes out when I speak. But statistically, think of the implications of this. He now eliminates seven eighths of the descendants of Abraham when he says that my son will not only be the seed of the woman, the descendants of Abraham, but the line of Isaac. Now Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. Now God eliminates 50% of the line of Abraham and Isaac when he says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, and the descendants of Abraham, and the line of Isaac. Now Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and I'm getting a little behind myself here. And now God eliminates 50% of them when he says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, and the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, and the line of Jacob. Now Jacob had 12 sons, out of which came the 12 tribes of Israel. Now think of this statistically. Now God eliminates 11 twelfths of the tribes of Israel when he says that my son will not only be of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman, the lineage and the descendants of Abraham, the line, of Zion, the line of Jacob, and the tribe of Judah. Now within the tribe of Judah, there were many family lines. Now God eliminates all the family lines but one. When he says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, the lineage and the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse. Now Jesse had eight children. Now think of this statistically. Now God eliminates seven eighths of the family line of Jesse. When he says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse, and the house of David. And then we go down to about 1012 BC in Psalm 22 with a very unusual prophecy where now God says, My son will not only be of the seed of the woman, the lineage of the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the family of Jesse, the house of David, but he will be crucified. His hands and his feet will be pierced against a tree. That's 1,012 B.C. Come on, Josh, a lot of people were crucified. Yes, but folks, you got to understand, that method of crucifixion was not put into effect until 800 years later by the Romans. And then God narrows it down further. And one day, there were 29 prophecies fulfilled. It's all documented. All this is documented in the big book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And now, God, these are seven prophecies in one day he fulfilled. In Psalm 41 and Zechariah 11, when now God says that my son will be the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the sons of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, family does the house of David, be crucified, but he'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces, not 29.99, 30 pieces of silver, not gold. Now think of this, another 50%, not gold, silver. It'd be thrown on the floor, not placed at the table. It'd be in the temple, not in the market, and it'd be used to buy a potter's field. And then God narrows it down further. Of all the cities of the world, and Micah 5, 2 eliminates them all but one, a small city of less than a thousand people for the entrance of the Messiah into humanity. When he says that my son will not only be the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the of Abraham, line of Zion, line of Jacob, tribe of Judah, family of Jesse, house of David, be crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown on the floor, in the temple, used to buy a potter's field, but he'd be born in that little tiny city of Bethlehem of Freda. And a professor once said, come on, Josh, if God was that smart, he could tell when it was going to happen. I said, he did. You say, what? Yeah. In Malachi 3, you might call it Malachi, but in Malachi 3, <laughs> God narrows it down further when he gets the timeline. He says, my son will be born of the seed of the woman, and lean Shem, the son of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, tribe of Judah, family of Jesse, house of David, be crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown on the floor, in the temple, used to buy a potter's field, born in the city of Bethlehem, and it will all take place before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. When was that? 70 A.D. Whoa. You ought to see it when I do all 333. It takes me an hour and 12 minutes to go through all of them one after another. 333 prophecies, all fulfilled in one person? Professor said to me, Josh, it's all a coincidence. (laughs) Well, 
let's see that. Take just eight of these prophecies. Just eight. Of the 333 prophecies, just eight. And this is all documented. You take eight of these prophecies. The probability they could be fulfilled in just one person would be one in every one times ten to the seventeenth power. That's ten with seventeen zeros. That's almost equal to the national debt. It's ten with se- it's more in fact. Uh, it'll get there soon, though. But it's ten with seventeen zero after it. Where is that slide? Yeah, probability that just eight of these prophecies could be fulfilled in one individual. Now, I don't know about you, but my, I can't get my mind around that. So let me give you a word picture. Take the state of Texas. I spent up a wonderful week there one night. It's huge. <laughs> Take the state of Texas, two feet deep of silver dollars. I got to tell you this one. This, in Russia, <laughs> this Texan was there, and he was literally just bragging about how big Texas was. And the illustration he gave, he says, you can get in the train. And you can travel for seven days and still be in Texas. And the Russian said, boy, I know what you mean. We have the same problem with our trains. <laughs> I love that. It's just, that's so true. But you take the entire state of Texas, two feet deep of silver dollars. Take one silver dollar, put a red check on it. Blue, purple, whatever your favorite university color is. Just put a red check on it or whatever. And then throw it in and use bulldozers and mix up the entire state. Then take a man in El Paso, blindfold him, and let him start wading through two feet deep of silver dollars. And in a random time, he just stops. Blindfolded, reaches down, picks up a silver dollar. The probability that in his first pick, he would pick the check silver dollar out of the entire state of Texas two feet deep. You're starting to see why intellectually I had to struggle with this is the same probability of only eight of the 333 prophecies ever being fulfilled in one person. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.